The last video took us through what abiogenesis is not. It's not evolution and not spontaneous generation. This video will, instead, take us through a possible scenario that could theoretically result in living organisms. First, we'll look at some different ideas of abiogenesis and then we'll follow the process of abiogenesis as it happens in the book The Vital Question by Nick Lane. So let's jump right in. Charles Darwin expressed to his friend Joseph Hooker in a letter in 1871, Quote, but if, and oh what a big if, we could conceive in some warm little pond with all sorts of ammonia and phosphoric salts, light, heat, electricity, etc. present, that a protein compound was chemically formed, ready to undergo still more complex changes. Close quote. As much as Darwin got right, this was one thing he got wrong. Life couldn't have started in a warm little pond, because we know from bioenergetics that life needs a constant stream of organic material. And, previously, researchers thought that the Earth's early atmosphere was highly reducing. That's the tendency of a chemical to gain electrons, i.e. become reduced. And made of lots of hydrogen, carbon monoxide, and hydrogen sulfide. Under this assumption, Alexander Operin and J.B.S. Haldane developed the primordial soup hypothesis in the 1920s and 30s. However, the fairly recent discovery of oxidized cerium showed that Earth's atmosphere wasn't entirely reducing. Regardless, the geochemistry of early Precambrian strata shows that the oceans were primarily reducing. So, modern hypotheses of abiogenesis focus on deep ocean vents, specifically alkaline vents. Alkaline vents are hydrothermal vents, or oceanic fissures from which heated water issues, that release highly basic water. In the ancient oceans, with the water being somewhat acidic, around pH 6, and containing carbon dioxide, the alkaline vents will release their basic water, around pH 10, containing much hydroxide and dihydrogen, and the water from the vents will make the ambient water rich in carbon dioxide. As the alkaline vents spewed their chemicals, ultramafic ocean crust, which is rock containing mostly iron, magnesium oxide, and potassium, below the vents underwent the process of serpentinization. You see, as lava cools, minerals are formed within it, called the Bowen Reaction Series, including olivine, pyroxene, amphibole, biotite, plagioclase, orthoclase, muscovite, and quartz. Olivine becomes the mineral serpentine through the process of serpentinization, which produces hydrogen, methane, minor amounts of formate, ammonia, and calcium with trace amounts of acetate, molybdenum, and tungsten. These compounds and elements can be used in the formation of organic compounds. Now, the alkaline vents are very porous and have semiconducting barriers that help generate reductive potential. The more negative the potential, the more likely the compound is going to lose electrons i.e. become oxidized. The pores in the alkaline vents contain iron, nickel, and sulfur, which exist together normally as grygite, that facilitate the movement of electrons. When dihydrogen is in water at pH 10, the process of combining it with the carbon dioxide can be catalyzed by the iron sulfide barrier and produces a natural proton gradient, resulting in CH2O or formaldehyde. In other words, thermodynamics aided in producing the first organic molecules. It's not the enemy of abiogenesis. Biochemist Nick Lane has shown by doing this experiment in the lab that the reaction produces formaldehyde as well as formate, ribose, deoxyribose, and other simple organic compounds. These compounds can accrue within the pores of the vents, generating protocells that likely had their own metabolisms before the first heritable material formed. Phospholipid membranes form naturally, since the hydrophobic tails of lipids point inwards while the hydrophilic heads point out, forming a bubble. We already established that ribose formed naturally, so once inside a semi-permeable phospholipid bubble, it would have the ability to evolve safely. This could give rise to the RNA world.
It's worth mentioning at this point the retraction of a 2016 paper by Jack Zostak in December 2017. The paper in question was Oligoarginine Peptides Slow Strand Annealing and Assist Non-Enzymatic RNA Replication, published in Nature Chemistry and, as the title suggests, provided a mechanism for RNA to replicate without enzymes. Some have suggested variously that this presents a problem for RNA world, or for science and peer review generally. On the contrary, this is the proper progress of science, and shows its strength in eliminating errors. Importantly in this instance, the paper detailed one specific set of prebiotic conditions. In the event, the reason for the retraction is simply that they couldn't reproduce the findings. However, while RNA cannot reproduce non-enzymatically, it does catalyze its own reproduction via RNA sequences called ribozymes. As for proteins, they are made of long chains of peptides. According to the thiol-rich peptide world hypothesis, nitriles could have mixed with aminothiols, such as cysteine and homocysteine, to produce amino nitriles. Amino nitriles are considered to be the possible precursors of amino acids, which form peptides. Creationists seem convinced that proteins couldn't possibly form, a process called proteogenesis, but research by Liam Longo has shown that this pessimism is misplaced. See the 2013 paper, Simplified Protein Design Biased for Prebiotic Amino Acids Yields a Foldable Halophilic Protein. The 2013 paper, Prebiotic Protein Design Supports a Halophile Origin of Foldable Proteins. The 2015 paper, A Single Aromatic Core Mutation, converts a designed primitive protein from halophile to mesophile folding. And the 2016, Evolution of a Protein Folding Nucleus. And the metabolism of early cells was probably a very primitive acetyl-coenzyme A, or acetyl-CoA, pathway. Acetyl-CoA is a molecule that donates the chemical group acetyl, or CH3CO, to biochemical reactions known importantly for its role in cellular respiration, and coenzyme A is a non-protein chemical that also participates in biosynthesis, notably the synthesis of fatty acids. Now, the acetyl-CoA pathway cleaves an oxygen off carbon dioxide to produce carbon monoxide, which can be combined with other organic molecules to produce carbohydrates, nucleic acids, proteins, and lipids. Recent work comparing the acetyl-CoA pathway with alkaline hydrothermal vents shows that the two have an uncanny resemblance, as indicated by the 2004 paper, The Rocky Roots of the Acetyl-CoA Pathway. This paper says, quote, Geologists have suggested that life might have emerged at hydrothermal vents. Chemists have shown that metal sulfides, such as iron sulfide and nickel sulfide, can catalyze biochemical reactions in the absence of proteins, and biologists have suggested that the acetyl coenzyme A pathway of carbon dioxide fixation might be very ancient. New findings from the enzymes at the heart of the acetyl CoA pathway, carbon monoxide dehydrogenase and acetyl CoA synthase, indicate that metals and metal sulfides do the biochemical work of carbon dioxide fixation. Here, we propose that biochemistry got started when the two volatiles that were thermodynamically furthest from equilibrium on the early Earth namely marine carbon dioxide from volcanoes and hydrothermal hydrogen, met at a hydrothermal vent rich in metal sulfides. In this hydrothermal reactor hypothesis, a primitive, inorganically catalyzed analog of the exergonic acetyl-CoA pathway, using hydrogen as the initial electron donor and carbon dioxide as the initial acceptor, was instrumental in the synthesis of organic precursors to fuel primordial biochemical reactions. Close quote. Another paper, the 2017 Remnants of an Ancient Metabolism Without Phosphate, describes how early metabolisms could have gotten along without utilizing phosphate, even though phosphate is important to organisms today. And, what we should recognize is that all along the path to life, geochemistry seamlessly gives rise to biochemistry. At no point could someone point to a protocell and say, aha, this is the first cell. Each protocell gives rise to just another protocell, and only long afterwards could we say, these look more like true cells than earlier ones. So that's an overview of the current model of abiogenesis. You see now that it's not impossible, but simply amazing. It's a beautiful process, and I distinctly remember having to catch my breath the first time I read about it. How could anyone not be wowed by its majesty? Anyway, thanks for watching, and I'll see you next time.